with the difference. We're going to start with the difference between privacy, confidentiality, and privilege. And uh, yeah, Sandy just reminded me that chat is disabled. I had forgotten that. So use the Q&A for anything that feels appropriate to you um, to be interactive, to comment, or to ask a question um, so that it's not just year three of me alone in my office staring at a wall. Okay. Whenever I do this work, uh, I start from these three principles. It is, frankly, from my perspective, the only way to, um, to figure things out, to impose some kind of structure on the issues and the questions so that I can lead from values and clear ideas. So we're going to talk about uh, privacy, confidentiality, and privilege. These terms can sometimes get used interchangeably, but they actually really mean different things, although they are related. So privacy is, it's an individual right. It belongs to an individual. It is, I choose who knows my information, right? We've had some frustrating national discussions about privacy in constitutional law this year, but everybody has an interest in privacy, regardless of what the law says. So sometimes people are exercising their interest in privacy and a law says, yes, we agree, you should be able to do that. And sometimes people are exercising their interest in privacy by just shutting up and not saying anything or by making some choices, some shading choices about how they answer questions that they get asked. Um, so somebody says, are we muted? I cannot see that at my end. Um, you should all be able to see the PowerPoint. Um, if you can't, then that's not super awesome. We will adjust and live with it if we need to. Um, but if anybody can just use a Q and A to let me know if you have if you can see the PowerPoint. Yay. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Um, terrific. So I'm just clearing out those. If you saying, yes, I can see it. I appreciate your help. Uh, why does privacy matter when we're thinking about managing information? Because survivors are going to be making privacy choices when they interact with you. And some of what you do can impact their privacy choices. It can impact how much they feel comfortable sharing, when they feel comfortable sharing it. Some of it, you're not gonna be able to change. It is personal to them and an individual person is going to do it their way. And it's not your job to persuade them to do it your way. It's your job as a survivor-centered, trauma-informed provider to give them space to make those choices. So this is the point, like privacy and individual survivor choices is the point of all the rest of it. Uh, so even though it doesn't come up in a statute, I want you to remember that honoring survivor decisions and creating space for them to feel comfortable and safe making privacy choices is the point of all the confidentiality and the privilege that we're going to go on and talk about. Confidentiality is you have a duty to protect my choices about information. I like to think about it as a promise. And in your work, I think pretty much everyone signed up for this session today is working in a program that receives Violence Against Women Act, Family Violence Prevention Services Act, or Victim of Crime Act funding. So if you're getting one of those sources of funding, there is a law in place that says you must offer confidentiality to the victims that you serve. What does offering confidentiality mean? It means that you will not disclose personally identifying information or individual information about the people that you serve. And that includes that you don't confirm or deny that a survivor is working with you, right? Because we are leaving that choice to the survivor about whether or not they want other folks to know that they are working with you in an advocacy space or a shelter space or a hotline space. Um, 
and the survivor, because the survivor is the one making the choices, that's the point of the confidentiality, the survivor can always ask you to share information for them. They can make a choice to say, I want you to share information, but if you're getting this federal money, they have to make that request in writing. There's actually a rule. And we can talk about what in writing can look like, um, but that is the um, sort of the approach that has been chosen. Okay. Uh, in the email that you got probably about um, within the last hour, one of the attachments to that email is actually the law, the VAWA law and the FIPSA law and the VOCA regulations. They're all a kind of law. Uh, and so you have the detailed words. I like to send that out because then if somebody doesn't believe you that you really have that much confidentiality, you can just say, well, here, let me just show you the law. We can look at it together. Um, but I also think it's more interesting in a presentation like this to get down to brass tacks. What does it really mean for your practice? And what it means is you are promising to people that when they choose to share information with you, you are not going to voluntarily share it any further, that you're going to leave the choice about whether to share it with them. However, Pretty much every confidentiality rule or law out there has some exception to it. This one has fewer exceptions than pretty much any confidentiality law out there. That's an important thing to know because other professions that have a kind of confident, a kind of confidentiality might feel confused when you explain yours. Because they might think, well, I'm confidential, but I could totally share this information right now. And that's because doctor confidentiality is very different. Attorney confidentiality is different. Uh, child welfare confidentiality is different from the kind of confidentiality you have. But you do have a couple of exceptions. So if there is a statute, if there is a written law that requires you to share some information, then the federal law, the federal rule says you're allowed to do that. If there is a local statute that requires you share, that's fine for you to do that. If there is a valid court order, and we're going to talk more towards the end about um, what okay, valid court orders and some of the difficulty in sussing out whether you really have one or not. But if there's a valid court order, then you're allowed to share. And if there's what we call settled common law, it's a really lawyerly term, really what that means is at some point in time, the Iowa Supreme Court issued a decision, it set out a rule, and everybody in Iowa is supposed to follow it. That's what we call settled common law. You don't have to worry about guessing what that is. If someone is coming to you and saying, you have to share this with me, regardless of what the, whether the survivor wants you to, then you're in a position to say, well, how come? Can you show me the rule? And then it's up to them to show you the statute or the valid court order or the settled common law. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail towards the um, in the third part of today's session, in the give part of the session. In Iowa, you also have victim counselor privilege. So you saw in that slide that had the three steps, privacy, confidentiality, privilege, that Privilege is this is really a rule against courts. Privilege is a rule that says to a judge, I know you want this information, but you actually can't have it. And you can't punish someone for not giving it to you. Uh, and so victim counselors in Iowa have a privilege that says that you cannot be required to give evidence. And that's in all kinds of courts, all kinds of proceedings. And the evidence that you can't be required to give is that it protects confidential communications from a violence victim to a victim counselor. And remember, the whole point of all of this is protecting privacy choices, is protecting survivors' ability to choose what they want to see happen. So they can say to you, I want you to give evidence. I want you to go to court and testify. I want you to write a letter in this situation. I am going to give you written instructions to do so. So I really want to make sure we stick the landing on that point, that the point of privilege is to tell a court of law, a judge and the lawyers, you have to respect 
the survivor's choices about whether you know anything that the survivor said to their advocate. The point is respecting survivor's choices. But where the survivor's choice is to say, yes, please share, you share. Because your job is respecting choices, right? Not keeping secrets. So this can get confusing for some folks. I've seen some programs in other states have policies that say, well, will decide whether the court gets any information about what you told us. And that's not the test. The test is the survivor decides. Most of the time, survivors are saying, no, I don't want my advocate testifying. But sometimes it has value to them and they do want it. Um, so privilege means the court can't force you and the choice belongs to the survivor who came to you for help in the first place. And there are a couple of exceptions to privilege where a court can force a victim counselor in Iowa to share information. Uh, and these rules really differ from state to state. Every state has its own little twist and Iowa has its own little twist. So you can be forced to testify about the physical appearance of the victim's injuries when you first met with them. I don't know how much that comes up for you all, if that's a thing that you want to talk about, you can put that in the Q&A and we'll talk about that in the question section, because that's a fairly unusual um, exception. Uh, most states don't have that. Uh, another thing that you can be forced to testify is if, um, if the victim has lied under oath in front of the court and somebody on the other side of the case makes a motion to say, I think the victim lied in court and I want to force the victim counselor to testify to show that the victim lied. I think the chances of this coming up properly are pretty um, low and pretty rare because as long as you're maintaining confidentiality, I don't know how somebody else would have any idea what the victim said to you. But if it is coming up, I have learned that the way that laws get implemented in local courts can sometimes um, be very different from what is written in the statute or what the statute expected. So we can talk about that today if you want to. The other situation where you can be forced to testify is only in a criminal case. And there's a bunch of, there's a process that the lawyers have to go through before you can be forced to testify. So they have to prove to the judge that the information they want to get from the victim advocate is important to the case that there's no other way to get it, and that the value of having it introduced in court outweighs the harm to the victim or to the victim's relationship with the victim counselor. And then there's kind of what's called an in-camera private meeting with the judge to see if any of that is true, even if they persuaded the judge to look at stuff. So um, that is an exception. Again, don't know how often it's happening. Happy to answer questions about it if folks have it. But it doesn't mean that a prosecutor can just be like, I want the advocate to take the stand and send you a subpoena. And we're going to talk about what subpoenas really are and really are not. Okay, um, I know I already threw a lot at you, and that was just like the basics, foundation. But just remember, the point of all of it is survivor choices about privacy, privacy choices about information in order to create comfort and safety for the survivor to share, you make a promise that you won't volunteer any of their information unless you want them to. And the state of Iowa says, and you have a right, the survivor has a right to tell the judge, no, you can't have it, except in a couple narrow circumstances. So all of those things matter when we're thinking about managing information, when we're thinking about what is the get, the got, and the give, of how we ask survivors for stuff, how we get it from them, how we hold on to it. Okay. We're going to start with the get. Um, so thinking about getting information is what we're doing right now. And that means thinking about your, your role in getting information and your reasons for collecting information from survivors. So I want you all to take um, uh, let's take two minutes right now for yourself and think about the work that you do with violent survivors or for an agency that serves violent survivors. 
what is your role? What kind of information do you collect from survivors? And what is your reason for collecting it? And there's probably several different answers to this question, which is why I'm going to give you all two minutes. Um, I am going to be quiet now. One minute left. If you think you're done, I want you to push yourself to think, is there any other information I get from survivors and why do I get it? How is it connected to my role? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so thank you for doing that inventory. Having a sense of kind of who you are, what you do, and what your current practice is, and really testing yourself to always be able to answer the question, how does this connect to my actual role is incredibly important. So one of the things about not just that I'm a lawyer, but that I worked in legal aid and I was both a staff attorney and I was a manager and then I was on the executive team is that I have a lot of nonprofit experience and I know what can happen where we start, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a snowball effect, right? Just one more piece of information. Oh, you know what? If I just have one more bit from that person or uh, there's one person we served and we didn't know X thing about them. So we need to ask X thing of every single person we serve going forward. And it's not a big deal because it's just one more question. And then you wake up 15 years later and you've added a hundred questions, uh, right? Without even realizing what was happening. And you've totally lost track of what the connection is to the service that you're trying to provide to the point of being here and doing the work. And sometimes you've lost track of the negative consequences. So wherever you are in your agency, I want you to really ask some hard questions about what information am I gathering from people and why? And how does that connect to mission and values? So I'll give an example. Um, and I'll acknowledge I didn't double check whether advocates in Iowa are mandatory child abuse reporters or not. Um, but in um, Illinois, domestic violence advocates are mandatory child abuse reporters. That's where I am located is in Illinois. Um, and in many states they are. And sometimes I will meet with folks in other states and um, they'll wanna talk about child abuse reporting. And they'll say, well, whenever we answer a hotline call, we always make sure to find out someone's name and their address and their phone number um, and if they have kids and if their kids were present when they were hurt. And I'll say, well, why are you doing those things? And they'll say, well, then that way, if I have to make a child abuse report, it's a more detailed report. So I want us to hear that. How is that connected to serving survivors? 
how is that connected to a survivor-centered trauma-informed approach of letting people choose how much they want you to know and what kind of help they want or don't want for you, right? When people start saying to me, I am collecting information for the purpose of doing a more detailed child abuse report, they've lost track of what their actual role, mission, and values of survivor-centered work is. Um, and I understand why that happens. It's because there's a lot of pressure um, to feel like you're doing things right. But actually, if you talk to child abuse, um, child welfare folks, they'll say, we don't want you being investigators. That's not your job or your role. Um, so that is just one example of how we can lose track of why we are collecting information. I've seen folks say, let's ask um, you know, every single person who calls us whether they're a veteran. And the, and the answer to the question, why are we asking that question? is well because we have a grant to serve veterans but we don't know if we're serving veterans so if we ask everybody if they're a veteran then we might be able to have more numbers for the grant so now we've lost track of our mission and values because we're serving funders and we're serving grant reports instead of using information purely as a tool to serve the clients that we are here for the other really important question about getting information is when is the right time to gather that information there might be information that is valuable and useful at some point, but it might be traumatizing to ask it early, or it might just not be, um, like might not make sense. It might make a survivor feel less comfortable. The survivor might not understand what this information has to do with helping them. Uh, so we struggle as divorce lawyers doing domestic violence divorces about how much detail we needed to get from people in order to make a decision whether to actually help them in court or to just give them advice. Um, and it was unfair, I'll be honest. We asked people a lot of times an enormous amount of intimate, difficult, detailed, personal information, and then often had to say to them, I'm sorry, we don't have the capacity to go to court for you. And I wish I could get in a time machine and go back and rethink that. I really do, because I think I actually did harm. And so that's the other question to think about, which is what is the downside to gathering this information? Um, and what is the role of choice? How are we communicating to the survivors we work with that they have a choice not to share this information, not to share it next, um, to wait and see that they won't be punished for um, saying, I don't wanna share this information. What are we doing to create a space where people actually get to exercise in voluntary services, where they actually get to choose what they feel we need to know in order to give them the services that we are asking for. I want us to remember, you're, um, I am talking about doing victim services, advocacy, hotline work, shelter work. We are, you're not doctors. You are not diagnosing people. If you are on this call and you are a licensed mental health provider, you may be in a different circumstance from a victim um, advocate or a hotline worker uh, or someone who gets dispatched to the hospital. You're in a different space. And that's part of why the question that I asked folks was, what is your role and how does this information tie to your role? So always important to remember that there might be different roles for different professions and understanding what you are and where you come from. When you're thinking about how to get information, I want you to sort of think about these three major principles, right? Support, explain, and consider. Support survivors. You have to actively, affirmatively show them that the way that they choose to approach information is fine, that it is their choice. Um, why would sharing this with you help them? Not help you, but help them. How um, will you make decisions based on this information? How will you, how will it change or not change the way that you help them based on whether they answer and how they answer, right? So that's the explain part. How do people know what it means? I, I can't, recommend enough in your own life. Try 
every single time you go to any kind of professional, the doctor, the dentist, uh, the therapist, the lawyer, um, any kind of professional that you might visit for yourself, really pay attention to how it feels and how you uh, react to being in that situation and that environment. And what do they do that you like, that makes you feel comfortable um, and taken care of? And what do they do that you don't like, that makes you feel a little bit put off or, um, or confused or disrespected? And then take those lessons back to how you interact with people when you work with them. Um, but when you start asking people questions or asking them to share information with you, they are going to be reasonably nervous about how does um, this change how you help me. Uh, if I say I won't answer, are you going to go away? If I say I answer, but you don't like my answer, are you going to go away? Um, or what's the right answer that I need to give you to get what I need? So explain to people kind of why you're asking things and what choice they have and what you're gonna do with it. And then the final thing I want you to do is always consider whose needs are being served by asking for this information at this moment, whose needs are actually being served. And that's the examples that I brought up before, right? Is asking everybody you serve, whether they're a veteran, because you wanna make sure your grant reporting comes in well, that's not serving your client's needs. That is serving um, the needs of your funder or serving the needs of your agency. And is that really where you wanna be? I don't think it is, right? I wanna, we want to think about how do we do this in a work where we say centered. Um, and I know there's a lot of funder demands for information. And I think the most important thing that we can do is say to funders, I want to do this work, and you are telling me you want to fund this work, but you don't get to change the work as part of funding it. This is what the work looks like. We want to teach you what doing it well looks like, and we know you want to be on the side of funding the good version of the work, and this is what the good version looks like. Um, the other thing about getting information is that every single time you ask a question, you are triggering another decision point. Um, so I don't know if anybody's ever seen or heard about this psychology research that says the more decisions that you have to make, kind of the more tired you get and the less good you get at making decisions. Um, so I think of this as the cereal aisle. I mean, I literally, like in my house, we eat one to two boxes of cereal a year. We don't go through a lot. Um, and we know what we like. And I go into the cereal aisle knowing what I want. And I'm exhausted by having to scan the whole thing to find it. Um, so what we want to think about when we're thinking about getting information from people is, again, how much can we leave people in charge? And how can we minimize the number of choices that they have to make, the number of times that they have to decide is this okay or not okay? And again, because privacy is something that happens usually inside people's own heads, every question you have on a questionnaire or every you know thing you say is, oh, I just want you to sign this form or fill in this blank. Whether you frame it as a question or not, they are experiencing it as a, I gotta make a choice whether I'm gonna do this or not. Um, and they're gonna be worried because they are auditioning to get free help that they need because they've experienced a crisis caused by someone else, they're going to be worried that if they that if you don't like them, if they're not a good victim, that they're not going to get the help they need from you. So you want to structure your interactions around getting information as much as possible to let the survivor set the pace and set the tone. So it's the difference between saying, um, how much is your rent? each month, how much is your utilities each month, how much is your food bill each month, versus saying, are you concerned about meeting your bills? Is there any way that you would like our help with that? Right? Those are different things. First of all, it's a one question instead of three. And second of all, if the person says, I'm not concerned about meeting my bills, then they don't need to share any of that information with you. Um, and you are displaying for them respect. And so 
we're going to transition now from thinking about um, the get to what I call the got, if you're holding information. But in order to get from to get from the get to the got, um, you that's when we start thinking about are we writing things down? And when by writing them down, I mean putting them in a database or keeping notes. Um, where are we recording information? And when we record it, how do we record it? How do we write it down? Um, and this is something that we probably don't talk enough about, frankly, in any profession, which is this question of what are the words that we use to write down the information that we've gotten from the people that we serve? Uh, and one of the best tools for um, the sexual and domestic violence field that I have seen is from the Missouri Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Um, they created for their member programs in Missouri a thoughtful documentation guidance. And it's, um, it's a pretty detailed approach to thinking about this question of when people tell me things, how do I decide what I'm actually either entering into the database or writing down? And what are the words that I'm going to choose to use to do that? So I'm not going to go through a detailed discussion on that today um, because I actually think this guidance from Missouri is really terrific. I'm so grateful. And they just updated it, I think, last year. And so what we sent out in the email to you is that thoughtful documentation. There are some references in that guidance to Missouri law. Obviously, wherever they're referencing Missouri law, you would want to follow Iowa law. I sent you also in that um, set of documents the Iowa Victim Counselor Privilege Law. So again, you have a copy of that um, in case you need to or want to look at it. Um, but the, the guide about kind of how do we think about what we're doing why are we putting this down on paper? Um, and what is the way that we can write it that serves our need to help people, that it like facilitates us being able to reflect on notes to help people, and it facilitates being able to show that we are in fact providing services to people in a way that isn't dangerous or judgmental or harmful to the people that we serve. That's the guidance that's here and um, that I highly recommend that you take a look at. So what we're going to touch on now is thinking about um, what I call the got. Once you have got information, how are you going to protect it? Uh, and I am pretty sure that all the programs in um, well, I don't actually know what database you all are using, but it doesn't matter um, because no matter what database you're using, you're going to be thinking about um, what do you put into that database in a way that is thoughtful and careful. Um, so these are kind of the five questions and they relate a lot to the get questions that we already went through. Like, when you are asking folks to give you something, you're asking questions about why, how does this connect to role? But then the second question is, does this need to be written down? Why am I writing it down? What is that for, right? So when somebody comes in to, let's say you see them in person and maybe you're making a little bit of small talk to build that relationship and get to know them. And you say, how was traffic getting here today? And they say, oh, it was terrible, right? Um, it's usually pretty easy for all of us to be like, well, I'm not going to write that down. And then I asked them how traffic was, and they said it was terrible. I don't need to write down that traffic was terrible getting here. Um, right? That part might feel easy. But there are other questions that you might talk to people about that it gets that you start to think, ooh, I should write that down. Um, and I want you to always ask yourself, why? What is this for? Um, because one of the things that I think has happened is, and I blame my people, the lawyers for this, that too many people have begun to believe that the purpose of keeping records is to one day defend yourself against a lawsuit, is to one day defend yourself for having done, um, being accused of doing something wrong. And the problem with approaching records from that perspective 
is that it puts you in opposition to the people you're serving from day one. If you are keeping your records from a perspective of one day I have to defend myself, you are already in your mind in conflict with the person that you're serving. If you are leading from, there is a reason to keep track of what's been done here because it helps me to serve the person and I can record this in a way that doesn't do harm. So it leads to the next question, which is even if you are recording something, how much detail is needed? It's the difference between saying, um, worked with survivor to develop a safety plan is a different note from survivor has a 10 point safety plan. Here are the 10 points, right? Because now if you're writing down the survivor's safe, safety plan, you are creating risk, you're creating vulnerability that um, God forbid something happened with your database and that information got exposed, there's risk. You are creating um, risk that if somebody does successfully force you to share the information, there's something about that safety plan that gets used against the survivor, um, right? So you, um, and if you can't articulate why that much detail helps you meet your goals, then there's no reason for that much detail. Uh, and, and again, what I like about that Missouri Coalition Thoughtful Documentation Guidance is that it gives some suggested forms. They are suggested, there are choices whether your agency wants to use them that make it easier for your frontline staff to kind of know how much to record by using things like check boxes um, rather than large sections of blank um, space that people feel like they have to fill in. Um, Then the next question to ask is, what's the best method to document this information? Uh, so don't assume that everything should go into the notes section of your database to be retained electronically forever. Sometimes the best way to share information is to um, go to your colleague and say it, or to use a sticky note, uh, which is inherently temporary and may get um, destroyed as soon as the note is delivered. Right, so think about that. And I'll be honest, it's probably because I'm a lawyer and I'm a privacy lawyer and I'm a super nerd, but I think carefully about the difference between something that I would email versus something I would text versus something I want to say. So I will say to my best friend, or I will send my best friend a text that says, hey, I'd really like to talk to you. Are you available in the next hour? But maybe the reason I want to talk to um, that person in the next hour is because my husband's driving me nuts. Um, right? <laughs> but I don't want to type my husband's driving me nuts in part because God forbid he saw that it would make him feel bad. And I love him and I don't want to make him feel bad even when he's driving me nuts. So it's just not worth it to write it down when I can achieve my goal by saying, do you have time to talk to me in the next hour? That's a personal example. That's obviously not from um, uh, representing or assisting survivors, but it's the same set of questions. Where is the best place to um, put this down? What makes sense? How much makes sense? And please don't forget, we have the ability to talk to each other. Not everything needs to be in writing or recorded for posterity, which brings us to the question of how soon should something be destroyed? So your agency should have uh, record retention and destruction policies. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And then every time you're recording something, just asking this question, does recording this potentially, if it got out, if it were disclosed, would it do harm to the survivor? Uh, and the big thing there is we should not be putting our judgments and our feelings and assessments about the folks that we work with into notes because if that got out, it could do harm to the survivor. Both if it got out to the survivor, it would do harm to your working relationship with them and your ability to help them if they saw it. I always like to imagine, what if my client were over my shoulder reading my notes? Would I be comfortable with what my client sees? That is especially important in your work because I think that the ethical approach to um, victim services work is that the information that you write down about a survivor belongs to the survivor and they should be able to see it at any time. And in fact, it can be a really good practice that if you are going to record any notes about your work with survivors, 
especially if you're in person with them, that they have an opportunity to see it and to tell you if anything in it is wrong or needs to be corrected or changed. But if you wouldn't feel comfortable with a survivor seeing what you write down about them, you should rethink writing that down. Again, it's the same reason I say to uh, my best friend, can you call me in an hour? Not my husband's driving me nuts. Also, he's in court right now in a trial, so I know he's not in this webinar, so I'm not worried about him hearing me say that. When you think about how to hold information internally, um, I want you to think about keeping separate files. And I know that you know databases a lot of times are designed to link the files of, um, for instance, if you are serving a parent and children in a family, um, think about keeping their files separate, even if your database allows you to somehow link them. Information that's related to one of them and not the other one should be somehow separated, whether they are physical paper files that are separate or they are um, uh, profiles on your database that are separate from each other. Because there are some exceptions to your privilege statute um, in Iowa. And so if you're ever in a situation where somebody is trying to force you to share, you don't want to be in a situation where you're like, well, you might be able to force me to share this child's information, but I got all this information about the parent braided in there, and I don't know how to separate them out. We really, if you are serving both, we should be keeping separate record profiles for different people so that if questions about what will or won't get shared come up, they can be handled separately, right? And then think about, is there a space that you might be documenting information, but it's short term for staff to communicate with each other, um, right? So it's uh, maybe if somebody called on the hotline and said they were gonna call back in an hour and there's going to be a shift change, maybe all that needs to be is a sticky note to the next shift that says somebody called using the name Jody. They said they might call back in an hour just to give you a heads up. Maybe that's not necessary to share at all. That's really your judgment call as hotline workers. But if you do feel like it's something you want to communicate, again, can you just say it? Or is it just something that needs to be a short-term staff note? I can't, part of the reason why what I'm doing today is giving you guiding principles is because you know we have over 60 people on this webinar you're doing different things. You're in different roles, different spaces, different organizations. So it wouldn't be appropriate for me to come in and tell you that you're all supposed to do it the same way. Um, <clears throat> so I want you to take these guiding principles back and think about what is key to our mission and values in our work. And that also leads to the question of what is appropriate internal access to information. So really making decisions about who in the uh, inside our agency actually needs access to this information to serve survivors, um, to do the work. And how do we make sure that everybody who might have access to a file kind of understands what it means to have access to a file and how to use it responsibly? Uh, and paying attention to if you have a multidisciplinary organization. So if in your organization you have, um, you know, you have licensed mental health providers as well as um, victim counselors, and some organizations now have lawyers on staff, you have to pay attention to the fact that those are different professionals doing different jobs, and they have different privilege laws and different ethical exceptions to their privilege laws. And so um, client information related to their mental health care and related to their legal representation and related to their victim counseling needs to be kept separately inside your agency. And you shouldn't have any of those professionals kind of freely jumping into all those different files because they're doing different things. If what I just said raises issues for anyone, I am happy to do technical assistance calls or have you asked questions um, in this webinar, but I will be honest, this question of how do I approach having a multidisciplinary organization can be very specific to your organization, which professions are in it and how what you are trying to accomplish and how you've structured it. And that's why I'm available for technical assistance calls if anybody wants to do that with one agency. 
Um, and thank you very much, Julie, for letting me know that all programs in Iowa are using Empower DB as your database. I thought that was true, but then you saw me like pause and stumble because I didn't want to be wrong. The good thing about using Empower DB is that Empower DB has programmed itself to use a system that um, that uh, does not share any survivor identifying information with the staff at Empower DB. So they have coded their um, system in a way that means that their staff cannot read anything you put in there. So you don't have to worry. You've already done one step of the got well, because now you don't have to worry about that what you put in the database is getting exposed to tech professionals who um, are not in your agency. You don't always know exactly who's um, uh, working at EmpowerDB, uh, but you don't need to because they can't see your stuff. One issue that comes up a lot, and this is a hard one, and I think we need to do a lot more work um, in our field talking about this issue directly and specifically. There has always been an, uh, um, an assumption about advocacy work that the absolute minimal amount of, um, of uh, information, documentation, collection, storing it for the minimal amount of time is always the right thing to do. And at the same time, in the last 25 years, there has been more recognition by the immigration system, more recognition by child custody courts and other kind of official entities. Housing is another example that if somebody is a domestic violence survivor or a sexual assault survivor, that that's relevant to um, giving them benefits like a visa or um, considering whether um, you know what kind of access to the children uh, their abusive partner should have or whether they should get a transfer to a new unit in housing like we now live in a world where yeah you know what like if you have experienced this violence there are there is certain kinds of help you can access and one of the ways that you prove you've experienced this violence in all these systems is to prove that you've worked with an advocate the reason for that was to say people don't have to go to the police. They don't have to go to court. Um, uh, if they went to an advocate, then they can use that interaction as a way to prove that they really have suffered this harm. However, if we are following a minimal documentation standard and information is destroyed quickly, then we might not have the information to help people prove that they came to us. Am I making sense with this? Please ask questions if you have them. There's not an easy answer to this question. I have talked to programs who say we keep everybody's records for five years in case any one of them happens to be an immigrant. That doesn't seem like the right answer to me because actually when people walk in the door to get help from you, they, they know they're an immigrant in that moment. They know that they might um, have issues with their status in the United States. Uh, and you can, as part of, literally as part of safety planning um, and sort of life planning, you can talk to them about the possibility that they might want to pursue VAWA petition or a U visa or a T visa or some kind of immigration relief based on having experienced the violence. And that part of doing that may be um, creating a record. Right, so you can be talking to them about what kind of record do they want to create. Child custody is um, a little bit harder because people don't always know that they're definitely going to be in some kind of a child custody battle um, down the line. Um, but having records that they've been getting, they've been seeking help, maybe for many years, can sometimes be helpful. I think what we need to do is be talking to people about where they're at and what they want from you and how they want to develop and store their own records. So we should be having conversations um, with lawyers in the community about whether that is a service that they can provide because there's ways in which lawyers are more set up to hold on to long-term records than, um, than victim counseling programs are. Uh, can we be talking to survivors, can we be talking to banks about doing safety deposit boxes um, on a um, on a pro bono or free basis for violent survivors? Can we be talking to survivors about 
creating a record right now. I don't know if you're ever going to need a statement from me, but would you like me to create a statement right now about how I helped you um, in this moment and then help you think about where you want to store it and how you want to make sure it's available to you later? We, again, we're not, I don't want folks changing everything about their whole practice to store excessive amounts of information about every survivor for a very long time. I want us talking to the people that we're working with about where they're at and what they need and what serves them. But what you do not wanna do is take on the role of being like an evidence repository, because if you take that role on, then the rest of the world is gonna to start to say, oh great, they're holding evidence, let's go get it from them. And you're gonna to start to have more challenges to you. Um, and so it's not an appropriate role for victim counselors to be in to collecting and hold evidence for people. Plus, you don't want to create a situation where folks are dependent on you. Okay, have a routine destruction policy for the information that you collect and hold. Um, have a routine destruction policy and then follow it. If you wake up one day and realize that you weren't following it, then catch up. So here's a perfect example. I um, do a lot of, I do a lot of meetings. I do a lot of phone calls with people all over the country. And I keep notes in these um, little notebooks. And I think when I write things down, I think about how much or how little needs to be here for me to be able to be helpful. But then I have a rule that these get shredded after a year. So when it hits a year, I pick up the, um, whatever file they all have a date on them and i pick up on the one that's a year old and i feed it through the shredder and then you know what things get really intense with my kids and sometimes i forget and i go back to my shelf and i'm like oh man there's three of these here that need to be shredded and i shred them right i don't decide i give up <laughs> i fell behind on my destruction policy i give up i'm not going to do it anymore i catch up um and have a destruction policy for your data files. I'm not sure what the um, uh, what the default sets are in EmpowerDB um, or how it is set up for you. If you don't know, find out, right? Um, but make sure that when you think about destruction, you're not just thinking about your paper, but you're also thinking about your electronics. And this requires work on your part. The point of the internet, the point of um, our modern data computer systems is to store information forever and make it available to everyone anywhere that it might be needed as fast as possible. There are a lot of upsides to that, but in the um, when we're trying to protect survivor privacy, there are a lot of downsides to that philosophy as well. So you have to actually apply the question to your data files. When should this be destroyed? How do we routinely make it go away? All right, we are gonna move on to the give. Um, again, I wanna make sure that folks feel like they can um, answer questions. I'm just gonna get rid of some of the ones that when you guys were talking to me, which I appreciate. Um, oh, there we go. If I hit done, I can make all the old questions go away, which means there's so much room for you all to put in new ones. Okay, thanks for giving me that moment. So let's talk about the, uh, the give of information, which is sometimes the part, this is where I get the most phone calls. People call me saying, someone wants us to give information, what do I do? Answering the give question is 10 times easier if you have done a really good job of answering the get question, why am I getting this? Should I get it at all? And the got question, how am I holding on to it? Should I hold on to it at all? Can I get rid of it now? 
When you get that give question, it becomes much simpler if you've done the first two parts well. So there are really three reasons why you might give information out. One is the survivor wants you to. Again, you are just holding information on their behalf. If they want you to share it, they are allowed to ask you to share it. Because a valid statute requires you to share it, and that is a reason to share it. That is an exception under the federal law. And because your privilege is an Iowa privilege, then the Iowa legislature is also allowed to decide that there's an um, that they want you to sometimes share information. We're not going to do a deep dive in that today. But if someone says you have to, you can say how come. And if they say the law, you can say, can you send me a copy? And then you can look at it and see. And if you're not sure, you can talk to your agency lawyer or you can reach out to us for technical assistance. The other time that you might give information is if you have a valid court order that requires you to give information. Um, valid is the most important word there. Just because it comes from a court or from a lawyer who is in court does not mean it's an order that the court was actually allowed to issue. Um, sometimes judges don't follow the rules. Sometimes lawyers don't follow the rules. Sometimes they don't even realize it was a rule. This is one of those things in every profession we all have to watch out for, which is that we understand our own profession so well that we forget that other people don't know the rules that we work by. And I think it's not unreasonable to make an assumption that judges know the law, but I'm here to tell you they don't know all the law. Part of the reason they're judges is because they're supposed to be good at thinking and they're supposed to be good at deciding but lawyers are supposed to come and show the law to them. They don't always know it off the top of their heads. Um, and if you have a situation where the lawyers who were in court didn't show the judge the right law, then they might ask you for something they shouldn't. So let's start by talking about releases. So I want us to think whether you call them ROIs, releases of information, waivers, I want you to think of them as instructions. I want you to Think of them as documents that describe survivor choices about information. So what I always say to folks, and this is kind of lays out the federal rule around um, written releases, is that a victim counselor waits for survivor instructions before sharing information. And what do I mean by waits? Well, it's written. So both the federal rule requires that it be a written instruction and also the um, Iowa rule requires that it be a written instruction, that it be approved by the survivor. So that can, um, I want you to think about approval in two ways. Approval is I signed it um, and it can be a physical signature. It can be an electronic signature, some formal mark that shows that the um, survivor has in fact had an opportunity to review this and is approving it. But I also want you to think about it as actual approval, not just you succeeded in getting a signature, but an actual approval. They know what it is. They understand it. And this is what they want because it's their instructions to you. Part of it being their instructions is that it's informed. They understand what the pros and cons are of releasing. Now, I definitely sometimes, when I say to folks, survivors should be able to give you instructions to testify in court or to share their information. I know lots of advocates who get very nervous about that idea. And they think, no, it's my job to talk the survivor out of it. That's what informed means is that I talk them out of it. I want you to think of informed as, these are the upsides, these are the downsides, but it's not my choice what um, what to do or what to live with. It's the survivor's choice what to do or what they can live with because what they can live with or what they want may well be different from what you would want if you were in their circumstance. Incredibly important to remember that a release cannot be a condition of service. You cannot require people to sign a release or disclose their information um, in order to get help from you and that it should be um, time limited. So people always say, what, what's the time limit? And at one point in time, we used to tell people the time limit is usually 30 days. 
But what got frustrating about that is we started to see programs saying the rule is never longer than 30 days. And then survivors were being told, you're not allowed to authorize us to share for more than 30 days. And that was never the guidance and that was never the intent. So I want us to think about the only way you can answer the time limited questions is if the survivor, it has to be the amount of time necessary to, um, to solve the survivor's problem, to meet their goal. If you can't identify the survivor's goal, then you have a problem with your release. And it's not about the time limit. It's that it's not really the survivor's goal. Um, so just thinking about time limits in the sense of what is the amount of time necessary to meet the survivor's goal. We are going to talk. I see the question about um, when verbal releases. And I'm seeing something both in the chat and in um, the Q&A. So let's talk about this verbal releases question for a minute. Um, So both the federal law and the Iowa law say it has to be a written release. If I can't change that. I have been struggling for years to think about what are the problems with having a written rule and what would be the problems with allowing for verbal releases. But uh, be that as it may, as my mother would say, the rule is that it has to be a written release. So you cannot invent an exception for verbal releases. If someone else says to you, you should answer my question because I have a verbal release from a survivor, um, then your answer is, if someone says they're working with me and they want me to share information, can you please ask them to get in touch with me? Um, or you can say, we can't share information um, without a written release and we don't know um, we can't confirm or deny for you that we worked with this person. If we had worked with them, you telling us they said it's okay doesn't tell us what they want, right? Um, now, I understand the frustration with written releases that um, many folks, well, especially in um, pandemic, right? But we were working with people and we're not in a room with them. But even long before the pandemic, if you were working on a hotline, if you were working um, in a rural area where people are at long distances from you, or you're in an urban area where it's just time consuming to get to you. Um, these are all things that make people say, written releases are too hard, we wanna do a verbal release. I'm gonna ask you to take a step back and think, do we need a release at all? Why am I the advocate, the one sharing the information? Why am I the one sharing the information? Um, because I have seen an awful lot in the last 10 years of um, systems wanting to, um, thinking it would be easier if advocates did all the talking and we didn't have to talk to survivors. Because survivors are traumatized and sometimes they're, they don't explain things clearly and it would be much easier to talk to advocates. So I see a lot of systems getting designed in a way that assumes that advocates will be doing the talking and survivors will be in the background. So the number one thing I would say is um, we should be pushing back against that idea. The point of advocacy is to lift up survivor voices and demand that systems listen to them. So number one question is, why am I doing the one, why am I the one doing the talking? Um, is that really what's necessary? Because a survivor, you don't need a release for a survivor to share their own information. You don't need a release to patch in a third caller on the phone um, who the survivor can then speak to directly and the survivor can choose to have you present for that phone call so that you can say to the person, hey, I feel like you're not listening very well or hey, I have a question. What is your procedure for getting on the wait list for housing? That's not disclosing any information about the survivor. That is saying to the other provider, I want you to explain what you do and how you do it and how it works. And you could do that without ever needing any kind of a release of information from an individual survivor. However, I recognize there are circumstances where you do need a release. You, the survivor wants you to do the speaking and you're required to do a release in writing. I want, I'm gonna show you guys where the confidentiality toolkit resources and I want everybody who's struggling with this question to look at the guidance on digital written releases. Because what we have done 
is done technical assistance and we have talked to the federal regulators about this, about using technology to achieve written instructions that survivors can improve without um, having to be physically in person and having them do what we call a wet signature um, where they actually use a pen. The goal of a release is to know what the survivor's instructions are and to support them to make informed choices. You can do that through conversations and then you can use electronic tools that a survivor says is safe for them to have some kind of a written record of what their instructions to you were. We're not gonna deep dive on this, but on the um, techsafety.org confidentiality toolkit, there is a um, both a recorded webinar, 90 minutes on digital written releases, talking both about what are the technology platforms that you can think about using for this, and also how do you think about it as a survivor-centered, consistent with law approach. Uh, and then there's also some written guidance there as well. And that is, I'm going to give you that web address in when we get to the end of today. Um, okay, so Stephanie asked a good question. Um, we have a policy of not accepting a release from another agency, believing that they need to sign our release so that we can discuss those pros and cons of the release. And other agencies provide blanket releases and you want yours to be specific. So um, you wanna verify that that's correct. So here's, here's my guidance on the approach to releases. You, I don't care about the piece of paper. <laughs> I, I really don't care about the piece of paper. I know the law says it has to be in writing. The point of all of this, what did I say at the beginning was the point? The point is survivor choices. So, if you get a release from another agency and the other agency is saying, Susie signed a release, so send us everything, your number one question is, what does Susie want? And I agree with you that just because Susie signed a release somewhere else does not mean that you know what Susie wants because Susie might have been coerced, she might have been confused, um, it might have been broader than she realized. And all those things have come up um, sort of in, in real life, both when I was practicing law and as a technical assistant. So your number one question is, what does Susie want? Your second question is, do the written instructions match what Susie wants? And do they match this federal requirement about what releases are supposed to look like? So if you talk to Susie and Susie says, yes, this is what I want. And the release that you got from the other place is in writing and it has been approved by Susie. And Susie has been able to make an informed decision about the pros and cons. And you've had a conversation with her where you believe that she's making an informed decision. And that release is reasonably time limited. And that release is specific to what Susie wants. I would be okay with it if you use the other agency's release. But notice that there were about five caveats before I got to the point of saying I'm okay. So I think this is a real organizational question about how you run your agency. Um, you might have something that says, you know, depending on how big or small your agency is, a manager or um, a director would have to approve disclosure of information based on a release that came from somewhere else because we have very good reason to be nervous about those releases. But I also hate the idea that Susie might say to you, yes, this is what I want. Yes, it's informed. See, it expires in 14 days and it's super narrow to this one thing and it's gonna help me get something done. And then you say to Susie, you're gonna have to drive in and sign something in front of me. Like, I don't like that answer because that doesn't feel survivor centered. So that's why we're always leading from how are we achieving the goal of protecting survivor choice? So I recommend that managers, leaders in programs think about this question. How do you want your staff to handle this? Um, but how do we always make sure that our process and our procedure leads from protecting Susie's choices, knowing what they are and protecting them, and then making things as easy as possible for Susie. Susie being my made up survivor. Um, so I know, Stephanie, that that is not a yes, no answer um, to, um, and it's, and I'm not saying that the way that you currently do it is um, wrong. 
but I am saying it is possible that you might be able to open up a little bit that if something met all of Susie's goals and this federal rule about the elements of relief is it might be possible to accept an outside relief if that's what Susie says Susie wants you to do. Um, okay, we talked about time limited. Um, if you are interested in seeing a model release, there is a template, and I'm going to give you that techsafety.org website, and there is a model release template. Oh, actually, we sent you the model release template in the email, so you all can see it and look at it. I'm going to be really honest with you. The words in that model template were so carefully chosen to keep it at a, I believe, a sixth grade reading level. So if you look at that release template and you feel inclined to change it, ask yourself, can I keep it at a sixth grade plain language reading level? Because we want this to be as simple as possible for survivors to access. Um, it's also available in Spanish. It's available in large print on the website. And um, please do not use the template without also using the instructions about how to work with survivors um, for a um, for signing a release. And a lot of that how to work with survivors, some of that is what you're hearing from me today in today's presentation, but there's some additional supports there. We've got to support our frontline staff on how to use release as well, because otherwise what can happen is releases just become like a, a bureaucratic hurdle that I got to get your signature on this form before I can get anything done. And we want to get um, folks to focus on the choice making and the um, survivor support and the conversation. And then the form is kind of the last step in that. And that's what those instructions focus on. Um, we already talked a little bit about can the survivor control this disclosure? You don't need to get a release signed to give a survivor's information to the survivor. Sometimes folks make them sign releases. It's the survivor's information. You can give it to the survivor. No release is needed if the survivor is disclosing for themselves. You can support a survivor to disclose. The most impactful advocacy that anybody ever did that I saw was join a client to meet with me when I was the client's lawyer and I was doing a terrible job listening to my client. Maybe I was listening, but I was doing a terrible job um, putting my client's wishes first as opposed to my desires to win in court. Uh, and my client chose to bring her advocate with her to the meeting and the advocate did not disclose any information about the client who was sitting next to her. All the advocate did was control me, the lawyer, and say, I feel like you're not listening. I feel like you're not hearing. I feel like you need to explain better why this is um, the survivor solution is unacceptable. Um, and I will never forget that day. And that is way more effective than it would have been if the survivor had given that advocate a release and then the advocate had called me and we'd had a private conversation where they were disclosing information. I don't think it would have been anywhere near as impactful. So really think about how can you think about your role as facilitating people being heard by the rest of the world. Um, all right, we're going to talk relatively briefly about subpoenas, warrants, and court orders. Um, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about them and this whole give question, way too many people give information when they get a subpoena. Subpoenas are almost never court orders. Subpoenas are the most common document that might come into you, but they are almost never court orders. They are usually signed by lawyers um, who are in court working on cases uh, and who um, want information from you. And a subpoena, I like to think of it as a formal letter. It's a formal invitation to have a discussion about whether information will be shared. Um, and so if you get a subpoena and it is not signed by a judge, it can't be ignored, but it almost certainly is not a court order. And because you guys have privilege, it might be an inappropriate request for information, right? So you have this privilege rule in Iowa that says they can't force you 
to turn over information and they can't punish the survivor for not turning it over or punish you for not turning it over. Um, that doesn't mean they won't try. And that leads us to the question that someone just asked where our local prosecutors often say um, subpoenas are court orders. So first of all, if it's not signed by a judge, no judge has like put their weight behind it or adopted it. Second of all, every state provides a method for people who receive subpoenas to go in front of the court and say, Your Honor, we think this is an inappropriate request. We've actually, if you follow the news at all, um, uh, there are a lot of powerful people who have been getting subpoenaed lately, both by the January 6th committee and by a prosecutor in Georgia, and they are suing left and right to say, I don't want to answer the subpoena. You have the same power. And in fact, not only do you have the same power, you have a law that says you can't be forced to answer the question. So it is up to you to enforce that law. And when I say up to you, I don't mean you frontline staff person who doesn't get paid nearly enough for the hard work you do. It's up to leaders and organizations to make sure that you are protecting your team. So if subpoenas are coming in that are directed at frontline staff, you need to have, um, you need to have uh, executive directors stepping in or managers stepping in to um, support and protect that frontline staff. We need to be developing your access to lawyers who can help you. We do technical assistance, both for agencies that are dealing with subpoenas and for um, lawyers who are representing agencies. Uh, we, we help a lot and very often. We can't represent you in court because I'm not an Iowa lawyer. But um, but we do give technical assistance and we've been able to um, make a big difference for programs in a lot of places by doing that. So um, if your prosecutor says that this is an order and therefore you have to answer it, then I think your program very much needs an attorney to help you talk to the prosecutor, frankly. Um, and if necessary, go in front of the judge. Because remember, I said you have a privilege and the privilege is you can't make me. There is this exception for criminal court that in criminal court, first the prosecutor has to go in front of the judge or the defense attorney has to go in front of the judge and persuade the judge that you have some information that's really relevant to the case, that there's no other way to get that information and that making you turn it over will do um, less harm than good. And then there's a private meeting with the judge called an in-camera review where the judge looks at the information and decides whether or not they think any of the lawyer's representations were correct. And then maybe the information will get released. So if you have prosecutors in your county who are just sending you a subpoena not signed by a judge where they haven't done those four steps, they are cutting corners and hoping you won't notice. Now, I know that um, uh, lawyers can sometimes invent rules that, you know, it, it, it applies here. And I believe it's a rule and I have power and so I'm going to enforce it. And the only way to kind of deal with that is to develop your own power. And so one of the ways you develop your own power is A, by having a consistent response, B, by not being afraid of going in front of the court, and C, by getting um, an attorney to help your agency. And if you are not sure where you would find an attorney, how you would pay an attorney, how your agency would handle that, you should be reaching out. You can reach out to the Coalition for Support and Help. You can also reach out to Confidentiality Institute. Sometimes we're able to help folks find pro bono lawyers. Um, I will say this, this is the one thing um, about subpoenas, they can't be ignored. So you can't ignore them, but that doesn't mean you have to turn information over. It does mean you have to deal with it. So to the extent it's an order that you got to deal with it, that's true. Um, but it is not an order that says, just because I, the prosecutor, wrote this out, that means that privilege law doesn't apply. No, 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 no. Um, all right, we have five minutes left. I'm glad you guys asked the questions about verbal releases because it's really important. Um, you have these slides. One of the things that folks tend to either lose track of or forget when they get a subpoena is, again, the whole point of confidentiality and privilege was to protect survivor choice 
Does the survivor even know this subpoena got issued? Probably not. Most of the time, the answer is no, they don't. And so your most important question when you get a subpoena is actually, um, even before checking whether it's signed for, by a judge or counts as a court order, your most important question is, what does the survivor want? Now, if you cannot reach the survivor, then you assume that they want you to protect the information. But if you can reach them, they might say, no, what I want is to have this shared. I'm making an informed decision to do that. I'm going to give you instructions. Let's talk about the most efficient way to put those instructions in writing. Um, and there is on the confidentiality toolkit on techsafety.org, there is a guide to a tip sheet for responding to a subpoena. So that's a really good tool for you to use if this comes up. Um, again, even if that subpoena is a court order, it doesn't mean it's a valid court order. So you're going to work with legal counsel for your agency to sort that out. All right, I love uh, the time left for questions. It's a little shorter than I wanted it to be, but um, and again, I packed a lot of content into today. Um, frankly, each of these step four sections are sometimes a 90 minute piece all, by, all on their own. So if a lot of what I did today was dredge up questions, that's okay. Um, that is a useful thing to do. And you can um, go to the um, techsafety.org confidentiality toolkit. There are a lot of answers in there, but I'm not gonna pretend all the answers are in there. So you can email me with your technical assistance questions because we are the TA providers for anybody who is VAWA funded or could be VAWA funded, which is going to be everybody who's on this session. Um, and uh, when I say we, I mean National Network to End Domestic Violence Safety Net Project and Confidentiality Institute. We partner together to support you to do the work and get your questions answered when they come up. Um, <clears throat> All right, you got me for another minute. I'm even willing to stay on for a couple of extra minutes. Do you have questions? Oh, thanks, Sam. Again, we sent you an email with these a uh, handout of these slides with the federal confidentiality laws with the Iowa privilege with the Missouri Thoughtful Documentation Guide, with the um, model plain language release template, and with the instructions for advocates using that release template. I hope you find all of that valuable and useful, but there's lots, lots more where that came from on that confidentiality toolkit, which was a um, collaborative project between National Network to End Domestic Violence and Confidentiality Institute. And you'll also find lots of resources on techsafety.org around uh, digital services and um, electronic evidence in court and agency use of technology and survivor use of technology. It is just a wealth of resources. Um, but not always the easiest thing to search. So if you want something there and you're not able to find it, just let us know and we will um, uh, get it right to you. Thank you so much to um, Iowa Coalition Against Sexual Assault for sponsoring today. Thank you to our interpreters, both Spanish and ASL. I hope my pacing was okay. Uh, <laughs> And um, I hope everybody has a great day and a great weekend. I know it's Tuesday, but my mind's on the weekend. And thank you so much for the work that you do. Gracias, Alicia. Habla Elizabeth. Uh, solamente les queremos dejar saber a todos que van a recibir vía uh, correo electrónico una forma de evaluación para que nos dejen saber sus comentarios o cualquier otra duda que ustedes tengan. Muchas gracias, Alicia. Y gracias a los Thank intérpretes you. también.